Uh, well, I'm, I'm Julie Wolf, as you may have heard. And uh, I work at FireEye, and I do malware analysis. Um, so let's see. Um, I've also not actually, so I, I, I should possibly preference that I, I have not actually um, actually practiced with this slide deck yet. Um, so if the next if I seem like I'm surprised by the next slide, that just understand. Uh, so um, so just a quick introduction uh, to exploit kits because I, I see a lot of news articles and blog posts that get it totally wrong. And uh, the uh, let's say let's say you're. Um, an entrepreneurial cyber criminal, and uh, you you can do malicious advertising, and you want want to install some banking trojan, but uh, how do you how do you get you know from your sending your spam to having your fake AVs installed on millions of people's computers? Uh, so I mean, it could be either malicious advertising or spam emails or search engine optimization. Uh, SQL injection attacks, um, iframe injections, kind of the same thing, uh, or, or whatever. So phase two is an exploit kit. Uh, it gets you from, uh, you basically get a whole bunch of people, direct them into the exploit kit, and the exploit kit then exploits them and then drops an executable file of your choice on their system, which will usually go and install whatever whatever you want. Uh, it's, it's out of scope for the exploit kit, basically. They, they don't, the, the kit itself doesn't actually send any spam. It doesn't do any iframe injections. And it doesn't buy malicious advertising or anything like that. It, it doesn't even have anything to do with the malware. It, it's basically just a bunch of exploits uh, that have been wrapped up with some PHP scripts with a, a fancy reporting interface. Um, it, literally, that's it. It's basically... Uh, you, uh, when, the, when the victim is, is directed to the uh, exploit kit, uh, it'll usually hand it a copy of uh, Plugin Detect, actually, uh, which is a GPL program that figures out what versions of Flash and Acrobat and Java you've got installed. And then if any of them are out of date, uh, it'll send that information back up to the exploit kit and say, oh, you're vulnerable to um, CVE 2010-0, uh, 188, and then send you an exploit for that, which will go and then drop, uh, you know, exploit your copy of Acrobat and uh, run some executable that that was hosted there. So, uh, so Black Hole Exploit Kit is uh, is is um, uh, is um, it's, it's basically uh, a bunch of PHP scripts with a. Uh, that, that uh, present a, a, a very shiny, user-friendly interface uh, to the cyber criminals who are renting it. Uh, it, it reports all kinds of uh, statistical information about like which country all the, the victims are from and what browser, ver what, uh, browser and OS version they're running and so forth. Uh, other than that, it's basically just a, a bunch of like old uh, exploits, basically. Most of the, uh, and like literally, it's, they're, they're not really any different from any of the exploits, the, the, the same copies of the exploits you see everywhere else. Um, so, um, most of this actually is actually all true for all exploit kits, really. So, uh, the, uh, so Black Hole, it, it um, the first version was released in September of 2010. Uh, it, since it's written in PHP, it's completely platform independent. So, because uh, I've seen a lot of people say, uh, you know, who are reporting that, oh, this only runs, or, you know, this only runs on Linux systems or Windows or whatever. No, it's, it's just PHP scripts. You just drop it anywhere. Uh, I, I've seen, like, a, whole bunch, a lot of um, FreeBSD. Uh, Hosting providers with like NGX um, lately, so uh, it, it also has a dependency on MySQL uh, because it, it um, for two things it basically stores all the statistics about who gets exploited with what, and then it also has um, the uh, what was it, and then it also does uh, IP blacklisting so that uh, so that if Googlebot crawls 
it, it, it'll return like something inoffensive uh, rather than end up in Google safe browsing. Uh, and so there's basically a big database of IP addresses as well. It's, it's all stored in MySQL. Um, the, uh, the first version I also suspect was, was based on a, a previous exploit kit, but I haven't, I haven't quite identified which one it is yet. Uh, they're, they're all kind of very, very similar. Uh, so it's, it can be hard to tell. So uh, also, I, is anybody here a native Russian speaker? Okay, so I'm probably going to be, I'm probably going to embarrass myself for this whole talk because I kept dropping Russian words in, but I haven't actually learned to speak Russian yet. So, or rather, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of learning it. Uh, the, the slang term that's used for an exploit bundle or pack is, uh, let me see if I can pronounce this right. Sviazki, uh, is that right? I don't know. Anyway, it's uh, if you type, if you so there's um, so Google kind of doesn't translate Russian very well, uh, and um, if you if you just take like the, uh, the 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 announcements for like oh there's a new version of Blackwell out here's the features uh, it's full of all this slang terms uh, that you drop it into Google Translate and it. Uh, and I'll say something like, um, please send me your new clothes or something. And, uh, and then, then you actually sit down, and, I, and if you actually know like just barely enough Russian grammar and vocabulary to like actually translate it, it's it more correctly translated is, uh, I invite everyone to upgrade. Um, so uh, anyway, so this particular word is translated as ligaments by Google Translate, and that's like, it's either ligaments or bundle. Those are the only two options. Um, but it's, it's more, the meaning is more, more like a, uh, a group of people attached together with cords or, or links. Um, it's, it's related to apparently the word that's used for uh, like URL links and stuff too. So it's, it's basically, this means as a bunch of exploits stuck together uh, is what, it's, what the, the meaning of that, that slang term is. So, oops. And then, uh, uh, the other thing was uh, actually after I did a whole bunch of this research, I went and uh, went to Google to check if you know what, else, what other people had said about it. And to my dismay, I discovered that everyone had already said everything there was to say about this. Well, well, almost everything. So uh, just to make sure I cite every possible uh, source. Just to you know, just to acknowledge everyone, uh, the, these are a bunch of these are some of the references. Um, I'll some more. Anyway, so I hope you're all taking notes on this. Uh, and so, and so on. How many more of these are there? So anyway, it took me like a couple hours to write this. So anyway, there. So. Um, anyway, the thing is, this is like leaving out all of the, the really, really terrible fluff. Uh, reporting stuff, not reporting, there's, so there's, a, uh, there's, this, there's this thing uh, about anything that becomes newsworthy. It, or, so in the case of like, like Black Hat 2.0 came out, uh, and there was an, an announcement on a Russian message board by the uh, author and maintainer and person who runs the business. Uh, saying, oh, there's a new version out. It's version 2.0. And uh, there's a Google Translate copy of it that got posted on a English blog saying, hey, there's a version 2.0 out. Uh, 2.0 out that just came out. And here's the Google Translate of it that you can sort of understand. And then, uh, and then a bunch of news sites picked it up and said, oh, version 2 is out. And basically reported, uh, basically paraphrased the blog post. Uh, and then and then a hundred other news sites then paraphrased those news sites. And then a thousand other news sites paraphrased those news sites. Uh, and, and so now if you go to Google and you try and search for anything to do with Black Hat 2.0, you end up getting two million hits of the exact same thing just over and over and over and over again. Um, so the other thing, oh, so the other thing that's, that, that fills me with despair every single time I read a uh, corporate blog <laughs> is this, oh, it's getting cut off on the side. So, so basically there's this Mad Libs. Uh, you, you're familiar with, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Mad Libs where, where you have like a little story and there's a blank where you write in like an adjective uh, or a noun or 
a location or whatever like that. Anyway, every time I every time I look at like a news story or a blog post about some brand new spam attack that's installing malware, it's exactly the same as the previous story about a bunch of spam that's installing malware. And it's been the same story for the last several years. It's this that, oh, we discovered a new attack. Uh, all the cyber criminals are now uh, impersonating um, uh, college mascots or something, and convincing people to uh, run attachments that, uh, or click on links that, that take them to this exploit kit that uh, drops some fake AV or whatever onto their. Uh, onto their system and so forth. And then, and then they basically usually pat it out with a bunch of uh, screen captures uh, without explaining any of it. And, and, then, uh, and then some screen captures they borrowed from some other blogs. And, uh, and so, uh, I, so I, when I wrote this talk, I was like, I'm going to do the exact opposite of this because I hate this stuff. So, um, so, and these are actually useful references. These are the, these are the ones I actually used. So, um, so I actually do need to acknowledge those. Uh, the, other, the other thing is pretty much all of the, pretty much everyone is getting the information from like these three sources. Uh, and actually this one's kind of optional, but basically uh, there's the exploit kit itself. Uh, and, then the, and then there's basically everything that the, uh, the author posts on a bunch of message boards in uh, Russia. Uh, most, these days, it's mostly uh, exploit.in. Uh, way back, like two years ago, when 1.0 came out, it was it was mostly on this website. Um, so, and then and also, you find a lot of interesting stuff turning up on Pastebin. Also, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So, uh, so going down the questions of who, what, where, when, why, uh, there there were three names associated with black, the Black Hole Exploit Kit. Um, and uh, Paunch is the only one that, that's currently uh, active or associated with, with it at all. Um, way back two years ago, uh, there was these other two guys, and, and they, 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 they've disappeared. Uh, nobody knows what they're doing these days, but uh, not Black Hole. So, uh, and also, it's very, very obvious from uh, a perfunctory examination of the exploits that they were very clearly written by someone other than the person who wrote the exploit kit. Uh, and, and actually, there was a, a discovery I made recently that, that leads me to believe that they may in fact be rented uh, by Paunch. Uh, so here's, here's why I think that. Um, so I, I discovered a... Uh, like a public chat log, there was an argument apparently between one of the exploit authors and Paunch about uh, not getting paid uh, for the rental of one of the exploits. Um, but it, it would make sense that, uh, like in the last 12 months or so, uh, there was like suddenly like Black Hole Exploit Kit got uh, like every Java O day, like that day, uh, f for like months. Uh, and then, and, but they haven't been lately. And, and also, actually, a bunch of the exploits got taken out of version 2.0. And it kind of makes sense that uh, if, if Ponch didn't want to pay the rent on those, that, that uh, so I know this is speculation. I, I haven't actually, uh, I actually haven't actually confirmed any of this yet. So, um, so this guy. Um, so if you type his name to Google, uh, you find some stuff, but not really anything terribly useful. There's a there's a bunch of um, message board dumps uh, of like these boards in particular. Uh, they're on um, they're on Pastebin, and the uh, really all it tells you is is that you you have an account on Pastebin. So I mean on on, uh, on Swiss faking and dark code. So uh, there's also a couple of chat logs and stuff like that. And, uh, and also, actually, uh, and so actually, I, I, rather than Google for it, I actually just put the, all the links here. So um, the, the current hit count on these is all like 22 or something. So I'm sure it's going to shoot up after this now. The, there was actually a funny, there, there was actually another funny one I found that's it's not on this list. Um, it was 
it was a, uh, a, a support conversation, uh, a, a chat transcript of uh, apparently one of, one of the customers of the x kit kit uh, with their hosting provider. And the hosting provider is like, like, hey, we've been getting all these spam reports. Uh, f you know, for your for your IP addresses and stuff like that, and like these guys are like, oh, I don't I don't know why there's spam pointing at this address, uh, and so and then they they were like, okay, fine, whatever. And then a week later, they're like, hey, there's there's like all this this is exploit kit stuff on your IPs, and, and he's like, oh, I don't know how that got there, <laughs> and and this is all like this anyway. Anyway, but it, it'll show up if you Google for it because uh, at the top of the message, somebody wrote, hey, Ponch, look at this, basically in Russian, so. Um, anyway, so uh, also if you actually, uh, the guy actually makes himself pretty easy to contact. I, I assume it's a guy. Um, uh, like in every single one of these announcements of like, oh, version 2.0 is out or something like that, he, he puts like all his contact info in here. So if you actually want to go talk to him or whatever, uh, that's how to do it. Um, it's a little bit fuzzy in that, but I, here I translate it. It's basically, uh, they, they, they have, um, he does a uh, live technical support, or customer support for uh, for the, the people who purchase and or rent his uh, his uh, exploit kit. And so the official support is is this contact. But uh, if it's an emergency and you need to talk to him like on the weekend, uh, that's this personal s <laughs> stuff. Um, so um, all right, so. Uh, there's not really that much uh, more to say about this, I guess, but uh, I was, so there was a, when I was, when I was, when I was going through the th one million or two log, blogs about uh, Blanco Exploit Kit, I remember seeing several that were like, we, we suspect that the Exploit Kit is, originates from Russia, you know, but we're not sure. I'm like, how can you, how can you not, no, <laughs> come on. Oh, so uh, how do they do it? So a bunch of it is actually all uh, GPL open source PHP libraries. Um, the the big big ones are uh, a GUI, uh, the uh, Max Mind GUIP database, uh, Plugin Detect, uh, which is the first thing you see uh, when you hit the landing page, uh, and then in version 2.0 they they added a, a there's a CAPTCHA system on the uh, admin login page because so, there was a uh, Oh, and also this, there's also like 400 icons. I have no idea where they came from, because uh, the the I did some searching by MD5 hash, and there isn't a, an exact copy of these files anywhere. But I can't imagine that whoever made this Explorer kit actually sat down and drew 417 individual icons, particularly for things like AOL, uh, links, uh, Mosaic, uh, OpenBSD. And BIOS, um, but I, I'm not sure where, where these are actually from. Well, uh, I mean, they might be from. I th well, I mean, I have a hunch they're from. An, they're, they're also like very poorly made icons, by the way. Can you see? There's, they're all different resolutions, and this one's. It's like they cut it out of like a screen cap, and then like colored, like scribbled black or like alpha channel around the sides, so they didn't get all the the spots. So there's like little bits of, uh, little pixels of background from the old, the original in there. Anyway, so um, I, the, uh, there's, there's a, a couple of really old x white packs from like 2009. Uh, they had a whole bunch of icons in their reporting interface with the same name. So I haven't, I haven't actually sat down and actually diffed the, the files yet. Um, so, uh, but the, they didn't, just on like really quick glancing, it didn't look like there was, there was other code sharing going on with that. Um, Plugin Detect is kind of like one of the big, big, uh, components of the Expo Kit. I mean, not just Black Hole, but uh, a bunch of other ones also. There's, there was another one I, I should probably put in here. Uh, the Red Kit Siberia pack did. Uh, cool Exploit Kit also, but cool, uh, cool Exploit Kit is almost identical to Black Hole, and um, nobody's quite figured out why yet. Um, Either, either somebody completely ripped off black, the black hole code or the paunch, whoever is uh, cha changing his branding or something for his exploit kit, I don't know. So, um, 
and actually there was a bit of confusion about this, uh, which also confused me initially also, was, was uh, in the, I think this was either, I think it was 2.0 announcement, I should have labeled it. Uh, it, it said that they, uh, they had stopped using plugin detect, but it, was, they were only, it turns out there was, it was just one module, it was the Java module uh, out of plugin detect, which is basically the, the get Java info.jar file. So, uh, and so the other thing is, the other big new feature in version two, which isn't really all that different from version 1.25, uh, was a, uh, was from adding like this, this cache system. Because there's actually, it turns out there's actually a, uh, a tool that's created just for brute forcing the, the uh, admin password on black hole exploit kits. Uh, so, you know, when I was, when I was reading through the, the Russian, when I was translating the Russian announcement, it, it said Brutus, and I'm like, is, does that mean like, like brute, is that supposed to be like brute force or something? And it's like, no, no, there's an actual tool named that. So, uh, why? Well, the money, basically, yeah. So, um, the question is, how much money? So, um, I, I reason that it should be possible to calculate, or at least estimate, some upper and lower bound on, on just how much money uh, Paunch is, and I, hope, I, I think I'm pronouncing that right, um, is making on, uh, making on this business, basically. Um, so I, uh, this is basically the, the reasoning. So the, uh, this is actually still current, really. Uh, the, uh, if you wanted, if you want to purchase this and run it on your own server, these are the prices. Basically, they're actually given in U.S. dollars, not in rubles or or red money. Um, uh, and it's basically like two hundred dollars if you have a bunch of domains, uh, and then and then you have a license for so many months. And then uh, if if you wanted to, you can actually rent uh, rent a box from Paunch for like like a day or a week or a month or something like that for a bit cheaper. The, there's, a, there's a bandwidth cutoff or something. But anyway, if, if you go in, if you look at the announcement, it's like, it's, it's right before all the contact info and like every single announcement for like, oh, version one, you know, 1.2 is out or whatever. So, um, so it should be possible to figure out about how many uh, licensed users there are um, by um, cl uh, clustering, so, uh, I don't know how much detail to go into about like n-dimensional vectors for, for clustering. Uh, group group the uh, group the exploits together kits together by uh, like common who is or domain registrant. Um, what type of malware they all release? Because because generally uh, the kit will all, uh, usually a particular set of. Uh, Servers will always be giving up slight variation, slightly repacked copies of the same thing. Uh, so you can group a bunch of servers together that way. Um, a lot of times they end up in the same like net block and so forth. There's there's a whole bunch of features you can use for for grouping the the actual servers together. Um, and once you have that, you can you can figure out how many licenses uh, we needed for that. So. Um, th anyways, this is the basic re reasoning, but it's basically, it, there's multiple ways of like dividing up the, uh, the time v uh, versus license fees and stuff like that. It's not quite linear, but you, you can kind of, if you take, take it all into account, it'll, it should work out. The, uh, oops, so, um, I thought there was actual, an actual slide with an actu some actual math on it, but, Anyway, so uh, basically, this is how you do it, and I haven't actually done it yet. Uh, and if you, if anyone here would like to do it, feel free to go ahead. Uh, but it's, that's pretty much, I think, how, how it would be possible to, to estimate the thing. So, uh, so here's a, here's this is code analysis. So uh, I don't know why this slide is here. Um, this is what I said at the beginning of the talk. This slide should be at the beginning. Um, 
Anyway, well, there was, it, was a, it was a thing about the news that basically every, every news story you hear about this is basically a paraphrasing of another news story about it because the main source for news is other news. Nobody actually looks at the code. Um, uh, um, so it's, it's not entirely a black box. There was a, uh, there was a very public leak of the code back in uh, May of 2011. Uh, the, um, the actual, uh, if, if you look at the, if you look at the actual code, it's, it's very, very clear, uh, that it was, uh, actually exfiltrated from some server on like January 20th, uh, 2011. Uh, it, it happened, uh, the database dump was from January 20th and then the, I think the rest of the files were from January 22nd. Um, the, there was a, one of the, somebody's uh, system apparently got, got uh, exploited with, and somebody dropped a, a C99 shell onto it, uh, which, which is basically like this remote, um, oh, give me all the files in the system and uh, dump all the databases for me, uh, kind of a PHP script. Um, the, the, uh, uh, anyway, when this came out, everybody was speculating, oh, it's like everybody's going to be running this now, uh, but it, it wasn't actually a complete uh, copy, but there was, a, there was a bunch of files missing, and it was also all ion cubed, which was enough to, uh, I guess, stop anyone who didn't have a decoder. Um, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. The, uh, it's also quite obvious from like, looking at the, the data that, that the, the machine that got, got exploited was that because uh, cause it's basically written all in the database, uh, all in the config file, and uh, also in the license on the ion, uh, ion script f files. So, uh, so the, the way that the, so uh, I mean uh, ion cube, so I'll explain ion cube in a sec. Uh, oh, the, the other funny thing was that, uh, that this, this same host is running a different exploit kit the next month uh, that I guess they gave up on on black, black hole for that. So basically, Ion Cube, it, it, it's a copy protection scheme uh, that basically takes your PHP and turns it into something that looks like this, which is kind of sp intimidating, but uh, it's, it's actually not all that really difficult to decode it back into this. Uh, and uh, it's uh, generally used as a license enforcement and uh, it, the, uh, well, what was I going to say? So, um, license enforcement and, like, stopping people from just, like, taking the code and dropping it on a machine and, and modifying it and whatnot, you know, because cause most people look at that and they're like, uh, anyway. So, uh, there's a bunch of decoders. You can, if you go to Google and you look, in, look for IonCube decoder, you'll get a, a whole bunch of junk. Uh, but eventually, if you, if you dig, you'll, you'll find a couple of programs to do it, and none of them actually work right. Uh, you can get maybe half the code, half to, uh, somewhere between zero and 100% out of each of them, but I guess about half on average. So you need at least two of them to like get most of the code decoded. Um, and so the, uh, uh, it, it does, uh, it also obfuscates a lot of the uh, API calls for, for PHP. Uh, but it's, uh, in, the, in the older versions, uh, it's, there's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. So basically, uh, there's a giant list of, here's the obfuscated name, and here's the actual function name. But uh, in, in the later versions, they, they changed it to a different thing. So it's still not that hard to figure out that, uh, that something like this actually means MD5 for, based on context and number of arguments. Because everything else you can see is just, just not that. Um, I should probably... I should probably put a bit better example up, but I don't, that's probably too hard to see. But you can see the strings are okay, uh, most of the global variables are okay, it's mostly just the function calls. Um, so, um, anyway, so that, so the, the particular leaked copy uh, was licensed uh, from, for between these dates. So it was a three months li license, so it was one of the $700 ones. Uh, and it was also licensed for use only on these 28 hosts uh, here. Uh, so I guess, they, I guess, I don't know if that means they paid another 200 for the multiple host license or something. But um, the, 
Anyway, but anyway, once you decode it, uh, you, you, whoops, once you decode it, you can go through and the source code and, and you know, see that, oh, well, this F, uh, that's, that's named file ID, and this E is exploit ID, and they're, they're mostly kind of used for bookkeeping. And, uh, although, I mean, I think the, uh, uh, th this one actually, like, selects amongst the, the exploits. I should have that on here. But uh, uh, the other thing was that everybody's like, where does this value come from? So in the older versions, it was a, um, a truncated MD5 of the current time when a particular thread was created. Um, and so, uh, actually, no, so basically, oh, well, here, so a thread is basically, the thread is sort of the basic unit for managing uh, a particular exploit. Or a, or, or a spam campaign or whatever like that. It's like basically, if you want, uh, it's like if you if you if you're doing some malicious advertising or some spam thing, and you only want people from uh, Chile to uh, actually be exploited, uh, you, you essentially have a, a specific thread ID, which is this random-looking number. Uh, in your you send that out in your spam, and uh, and then basically, everybody comes in, uh, the, the exploit kit you know, figures out with the GIP stuff if, you know, where they're coming from. And if, if it's from this country, then they'll send the exploits. And if not, they'll just uh, redirect them to Google or whatever. So uh, in, in version 1.22, uh, or Paunch added a uh, assault uh, that was catenated onto the beginning of the thread AD. And then in version 2, uh, there was also a couple of salts added uh, for like the admin password and stuff like that because um, if you could pull the config file off, you'd basically have the hash and then you could crack it because a, a lot of badly configured, so a lot of people who, who run this ex exploit kit uh, don't really know how to set up a web server properly and will like leave directory indexing turned on. Uh, and, and so you just go and like grab the, the config file, which is it has to be like unpacked, uh, and then basically grab the the hash and then break the you know admin password or something. I guess. And then the thing is like the point where you're reading the file off, you don't actually need the admin password anymore. So uh, I don't know. But for but I know they. I guess I guess Ponch or some, whoever you know read that salting hashes was good. So add that feature. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, so the actual exploits, like in version 2, didn't really change at all from version, the whole version 1 series. Uh, and in fact, actually, they, there was a great deal of effort put into uh, changing the, uh, like the URL name, because uh, because the old ones, oh, I, I put it, should put a new, an example of the good one in, but or a new one in, but uh, uh, the old ones look like this, and it is, com it is really really easy to detect when somebody's about to be exploited because uh, it's always main.php and a question mark and then a page equals and a bunch of hex values, um, and so so this has changed in version two to we use a bunch of randomly chosen dictionary words, uh, but, but the thing is that the actual you know, contents that are sent out are still identical. Uh, every, the, the first uh, like 4K of, of uh, this PDF file is always the same. Uh, you can basically take the first 4,745 bytes, uh, do an MD5 hash of them, and it'll always be the same value. Uh, there, well, actually, there was a slave variation. So there, the, the, there's, a, there's been a couple of minor updates, actually, and, uh, the the PDF was changed. Uh, there was a, a length uh, a length length number that was changed from 42 to 123. Uh, but the, other than that, it was identical. Uh, but basically, they, they added one byte uh, and so forth. And then also, the end of the file is always the same too. Um, and if you actually go in and pack the JavaScript in the middle, uh, it's it's only the only obfuscation is on like kind of the outer coding of, or, or outer layer. Of the uh, of the JavaScript in this, and so when you decode it, it's, it's actually uh, all the strings, are, all the string values are still uh, legible English, uh, which also makes me wonder about who wrote this. 
uh, the, the, there's a bunch of variable names too. There's a bunch of names like like uh, DAC root, I guess, and locks we, and I don't know what these actually mean. Um, uh, they, they don't quite mean anything in any, any language I've been able to track down, uh, but there's a whole bunch of them in there, and they're always the same. It's been the same since version 1.0 of the XY kit. Um, and it's the only place they appear is in this exploit. Uh, and, and the PDF is also like totally malformed, but that doesn't really, you know, Acrobat doesn't care about that, you know. So uh, anyway, so, so you know, like I was saying, the functions basically all look like this. So it's like, this is, this is the heap spread code, which is getting chopped off on the edge here. Um, that, yeah, it's basically, there was, there's, uh, there's the, no, the no ops, there's, uh, there's, you know, DAC wrap. It's a spray, <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's like literally, this is just a, like standard, like heap spray boilerplate plate stuff. Um, and it's actually, the, actually, the thing is, it doesn't even make sense in the, um, in the, uh, so I, I just realized looking at this, it doesn't actually make any sense in this context either, because CVE uh, 2010 uh doesn't actually need the heap sprayed. <laughs> It's it's done it's done with the uh, true type, I uh, know with the TIFF uh, Stack Overflow, uh, where where you basically get to um, smack the end of your TIFF file like on top of your stack, and so you basically just build a fake stack frame there with uh, uh, a bunch of ret ROP return-oriented programming code to point to uh, uh, essentially allocate a chunk of memory, copy the shell code there, and then run it. Uh, so this is actually actually completely useless. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and then I was actually going to draw a picture of, of the, all that stuff in detail, but um, I, I actually, uh, it's kind of embarrassing, I actually ran out of time because I just wrote that slide before I got up here. And this is about as far as I got, but I can tell you what the rest of this, what this rest of this will be, and, and you can picture it in your imaginations. <clears throat> um, so, for all the the Java exploits, uh, for throughout the whole 1.0 series, uh, the uh, the Java files themselves tended to be very static as well. Uh, not only were the contents always the same, uh, but even the file names were the same, and so uh, a lot of um, a lot of snort signatures for detecting would, would basically just look for worms.jar because for a long time that, that was the Java exploit in, in Black Hole. Um, for each of the, the minor point versions, the, the names tended to, be, tended to change, and I think about by like summer of this year, uh, they end up starting to randomize those. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's actually, in the version 2.0, it's actually a lot more random now, and they actually, uh, they actually unzip and uh, change the file names of the internal classes and then zip, zip the thing back up again so that, uh, so that at least the MD5 hash is different. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, um, digging through the, the, the code, but it looks like most of the Java stuff was essentially generated from a bunch of standalone scripts that were separate from the, the exploit kit and then just, just bundle up and distribute it along with it. Uh, the, let's see, the, the flash exploits are similar. They basically have never changed. Uh, most of them were dropped in 2.0 also, uh, but one of them has made a reappearance in some of the kits and, and officially it's not supposed to be there and uh, it's uncertain whether uh, it was added back in or if it's just certain customers like Stuck it back in somehow. The uh, what was the other one? In, yeah, basically in version two, the the uh, pretty much all of the exploits uh, except for three, I think three, possibly four, were removed. Uh, the four that were left in were the ancient Internet Explorer six uh, help file. Um, exploit because it's apparently reliable and a lot of people are still running IE6. Uh, the libtiff, the, the Adobe Acrobat libtiff one, which is uh, 
CV 2010-0188. Uh, but the, the older Acrobat exploits were dropped. Uh, and then uh, the two of the recent uh, Java deserialization exploits. Um, the, let me think, I think it covers most of them. The, the big news uh, that's just recently uh, happened is uh, the cool exploit kit and Black hole exploit kit, and I'm not sure which one got it first. Uh, if they're not the same thing, uh, they uh, there's a um, was it was the there's an a, a true type kernel vulnerability uh, that was used in the uh, the Dooku attacks from last year. Uh, the so I actually just gave a talk on this an hour ago, and I should be able to remember what I just said an hour ago. <laughs> that uh, um, is it basically uh, around October? Uh, what was it? Uh, CVE 2011-3402 uh, uh, essentially started making an appearance in a couple of these exploit kits, and I think there's a third one besides cool and black hole that have uh, that have got it now. And it's basically all the exact, exact same exploit code. It is literally bitwise identical. Uh, the uh, and and ha I've I've actually analyzed uh, a sample of the the original Dooku code from the Dooku attacks, and the the code. Uh, there's at least the three bit code that's being used in the black hole exploit kit uh, is exactly bitwise identical uh, to the to the attack code that was the exploit code that was used in the Dooku attacks. Um, so I think there's some sort of lesson to be learned here about uh, cyber espionage or something. Uh, the okay, the um, uh, there was, there, there was an interesting discovery I made last night, actually, uh, where it appears that, the, that uh, the, whoever was developing the Black Hole Exploit Kit had a development server they were testing on or something uh, that people had noticed because there was this, uh, what looked like a font exploit that didn't work on it. Uh, and then since it didn't work, nobody, nobody really knew what it was and everybody forgot about it. Uh, and while I was digging around for f more information on this, I, I saw this and I'm like, oh, I know what that is now. Um, so if you go to the uh, Emerging Threats mailing list, like from back in mid-June, uh, there's like a thread about, um, uh, it's like, hey, what's this, what's this weird font thing on this particular server? It, it looks like a black hole exploit kit, but it's got this, this, this other exploit that doesn't work on it. Uh, if you find that thread, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that that was like an early test of this particular exploit. Um, I mean, I'm 90 something percent. I, I haven't, you know, I don't actually have the the data f exactly from the site, so I, but I, the file names are the same. Uh, and and it it makes it matches up with the current version, so. Uh, let me think. Um, what are the other things to say about this? Uh, yeah, there's not, there's not really a, a lot of sophistication to the kit. It's basically, uh, here's plugin detect, uh, and then plugin detect goes and, and detects, and it says, oh, all right, there's a Acrobat version 7 running or something. Uh, and there's basically a bunch of JavaScript that's like, all right, if Acrobat 7, then load this exploit. If Acrobat 10, then load this one or whatever. If, if Java version 6, go to this, go to that, and so on. And, and it's basically just a big a bunch of F, nested if then uh, statements with a bunch of go fetch this URL if this is installed. Uh, that's, that's, and then, then it's an exploit. And then, uh, and it's basically the, the same exploits from two years ago unchanged, and so pretty much every, uh, if you go and read any an analyses of any of these exploits, it's all exactly the same. Because uh, uh, the, 
the, the developer of the exploit kit is not actually, doesn't actually touch any of the exploits. Uh, and then, I don't know. Uh, so it's, it's apparently, the, uh, this particular exploit kit is very, very popular. And I, I sus I'm not entirely certain, but I suspect the reasons are because it's very cheap uh, compared to all the other exploit kits. And a lot of the other exploit kits uh, will only take on a certain limited number of customers, uh, where, whereas this one will basically sell to anybody. And uh, let me think what else. There's a lot of, um, I, I don't know, I guess, it's, I guess it gets in the news a lot, so. Uh, so I, I mean, I can, I can speculate why it's popular, but I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty sure being really cheap is probably, probably one of the big reasons. I think it's one of the cheapest. Um, let me think. What else is there to say? I'm actually, I'm almost, I'm almost up to my time limit, right? So it's about time for questions. Isn't it? Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> Okay. We can take maybe a couple of questions. So the microphone number two. Um, you mentioned that the guy isn't writing the exploits himself. So did you figure out where the exploits are coming from? Are they from like the exploit or something? I found a, well, uh, yes. Actually, there was a, um, all right, so I found a chat log that appeared to be between him and one of the, the export suppliers, but I haven't. Actually, I don't actually comprehend r Russian quite well enough yet. I, I need to actually hand this to the native speaker and say, "What does this actually mean?" Uh, before I actually conclude that the, this, this is like an argument, <laughs> a business argument, or something between the two parties or something. Um, but uh, there was there was uh, there was another blog. There was uh, who was it? Uh, one of the big security companies published a blog basically like, oh, here, there's, this, there's this new, uh, it was like, this is back like in August, I think. There was, there was, a, there was another, jo uh, what was it, Java O'Day. I figure it was one. Uh, there's been so many. That um, it, uh, they basically did a side-by-side -side comparison of, of, here's the, the release proof of concept exploit code. And then here's, here's the, black hole code, and they're like literally like line for line identical. Uh, most, yeah, basically the majority of the, the exploits used by the majority of exploit kits are, are basically the, the public exploits uh, uh, with the serial numbers filed off and, and then stuffed into a new, new box. Uh, there was actually, there was, who was it? There was, a, uh, there was a trail of bits, did this really awesome uh, paper a few months ago that I just saw uh, that basically tracked the origin of uh, many of the exploits that were used in many of the popular exploit kits. And basically like 90 something percent of them all came from like uh, public, you know, white hat researcher sources. Uh, and even though there were like 10,000 other possible exploits, there were just these 20 that were always used because those are the ones that could be copied out of Metasploit or whatever. Uh, it's not, that's not always the source, but um, yeah, I think it was something like, there's, they had like little charts, but it was something like, you know, five exploits came from, you know, the ZDI thing, and then 50 came from these other sources, and then, and they were like zero, they were privately developed. Like no, none of these exploit kits have any, any original exploits at all. So, uh, I don't know if that answered your question. And uh, you seem to have obtained at least one version of the exploit kit, and you showed all oh. these addresses from the author. Did you actually have a chat with the author of the black hole exploit kit? Uh, if you do a bunch of, if you do a lot of googling, uh, you can find a lot of, uh, like a surprising uh, amount of uh, chat logs between a lot of these people. Um, I, I don't know entirely why why that why everybody likes po posting that stuff up in public, but um, 
I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm reading through it. It's, it doesn't, there's still not a lot of information that actually seems all that in, incriminating. It's kind of mostly um, complaining about their competitors. Uh, there was, there was a, I think there was, there was one I saw, it was basically like, it was like Ponch was like griping about this competition, like uh, pirating his, the exploits out of Black Hole Exploit Kit, and like, uh, there was some, it was a Russian slang term for like, what was it? It was like setting your ass on fire or something like that. Uh, I forget precisely what, what the English translation would be. Um, but it was, it was basically, his competitors were burning his ass because they were stealing all of his exploits out of his, his kit or whatever. Oh, okay. Do you want to greet maybe? Oh, I, the developers of the exploit, they might be looking at your video. I, they, that, that is, there, I, yeah, that, that possibility had occurred to me, I suppose, but I, I hadn't actually prepared for it. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Uh,